Can you, can you hear me? Or, all right. Well, thank you, Leo, for that. Um, uh, for that, I've asked for this mic because I tend to, to wonder when I talk. So uh, I'm going to move a, a little bit away from the podium. Uh, I'm told I'm the last speaker between uh, you all and some dancing and some breaks, so that's an unenviable position to be in. Uh, but I promise to try and make this short, sweet, and to the point, and also a little bit interactive. Um, the, the theme of uh, the best way out, I'm going to take a little bit of a riff on, uh, and instead make the argument that the best way out is out. I'm going to make the case for being out at work. Why does that matter? Why does it matter to the economy? Why does it matter to organizations you might join? Why does it matter to you as an individual? So that's my thesis for today. Um, you heard a little bit about my story. Um, I'm a frustrated wannabe academic. I was studying international human rights law when McKinsey came along uh, about 23 years ago. Uh, and I've been at McKinsey 22 years since. I'm now the partner that leads the function of recruiting for McKinsey globally, and I'm also one of the diversity leaders in McKinsey, particularly the, uh, the, the, uh, one of the founders of the gay and lesbian group at McKinsey 21 years ago. Um, I'm going to make the case for diversity, including LGBT diversity, at a very broad level. You can read the words on the, on the slide behind me as to why it makes sense for an organization, for a company, for a public sector, or for an economy, to actually be diverse friendly. And these are the sorts of reasons that you, know, you will most likely always, always see. Number one is really near and dear to my heart, which is the work of talent. We know that talent comes in all shapes and sizes and colors and genders and orientations. That's why it's very important for McKinsey and competitors and some of the other companies to sponsor an event like this. We want to try and make sure that LGBTQ talent considers us. But that's, that's the fight for talent, the war for talent that's out there. Um, improving the quality of decision making. There's lots of research that's been done that the more diverse team that you have, in terms of backgrounds, experiences, etc., the better, the more optimal the question. There's actually been research done where if you have a technical engineering question, building a bridge across the river, you have five people. If you have five engineers doing that, they will come up with a suboptimal answer versus having two engineers and three people with other backgrounds, because they will consider other 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 um, considerations than just the technical aspects. You need the technical answer for sure. You need at least one engineer in that team. But having a more diverse team comes up with a better answer as well. Number three, if you're in clients, uh, client uh, service like McKinsey, or if you're you know, P&G and you're serving, you know, you're trying to sell, sell widgets to, to consumers, again, having a diverse workforce, uh, having been diverse friendly and understanding your customers and your clients makes you much more friendly to them as well. Number four, employee satisfaction. We'll talk a little bit about that more. And then finally, just from reputation. Most parts of the world being diverse friendly is good. So for all of those reasons, diversity matters. That's great. That's sort of the standard, boring corporate business case for diversity. I believe all of it, but it's kind of boring. McKinsey has done a lot of work uh, in this diversity space, um, broadly speaking, over the last 10 to 12 years. So um, in 2005, sorry, 2007, we started the Women Matter Report. We did a whole bunch of McKinsey-level research globally on does it matter if you have more women in your senior management ranks and on your corporate board? We went into this actually quite, quite scared because we didn't know what the numbers would show us. We know what happens if we did all this analysis and we showed that it actually isn't beneficial to have women at those levels. Fortunately, it's the opposite. We were actually to, able to prove that having more women at the, at the top level of your organization actually is a good predictor of better returns on equity as well. That's right. Fast forward to January 2015, a bunch of us, the, the diversity leaders of McKinsey said, that's great, we've been doing this for women and we've proven that, and every year we issue another report and it gets lots of press. What about diversity, ethnic, and cultural diversity? Let's, let's try to prove that as well. Again, some trepidation. What happens if we don't prove it, if we prove the inverse? The good news is that great, having uh, done uh, studies on 366 companies, in the US, in the UK, in Latin America, in Canada, and one more that I can't remember, uh, we were able to show that it's actually 
um, there's a 35% increase in profitability if you are in the top quartile of diversity on ethnic and cultural diversity, again, in terms of representation in your firm, at the senior levels, in terms of your cultural index, diversity matters, it pays off. So that's kind of cool. I'll just show, I'll mention one last thing. Just last year, July 2016, the McKinsey uh, Women Group issued a report called The Power of Parity. And so this is, this is hugely beneficial in terms of diversity, generally speaking. If, if women were paid the same around the world and participated in the workforce around the world at the same level as men, just that standard, that would result in a 28 trillion, that's with a T, a 28 trillion increase in global GDP. That's the equivalent of adding a whole new US economy and China economy to the world. If women were paid the same and participated the same in the workforce. Diversity matters. This isn't just a sort of a nice feel good sort of thing. This is, this is why the broader diversity element matters. I'm going to mention now to bring it sort of from that big diversity level down to the LGBTQ aspects of this. This is the G part. I'm, I'm constrained by the data here. Um, has anybody ever heard of the book that came out about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, by a professor on the West Coast in the US called The G Quotient? Anybody heard of it? You're going to rush out and buy this book afterwards. Uh, when, when Professor Snyder did his research, he used U.S., this is all U.S. based, I'm Canadian, but I'm going to use American uh, stats anyway. Um, he used uh, about 30,000 data points on employment, um, employment uh, survey, employee surveys, to try and understand how do gay managers perform as managers in the U.S. body, out of gay managers. How do they perform compared to their straight colleagues? Again, we had no idea what the data would show. Um, fortunately, it was a positive correlation, and he wrote a book called The G Quotient. So in the same way that we have you know, IQ, and we have EQ, the emotional quotient, he said there's actually a gay quotient. It's actually good to be an out-gay manager, and he thought that he had proven it scientifically. So these are some of the research that he had. So, using all of this data, he found, what was the percentage of employees under a gay or straight manager that reported high, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test you on this, high engagement at work? So what he did is, you know, the, the question was, you're an employee, you're working in the US, you have a straight manager, are you, you know, engaged or highly engaged at work? If you're, if you're pretty satisfied, 21% of folks who had a straight manager said they were in those top two buckets. What do you think the, the answer was if you happen to have an out gay manager? So these are straight people answering that their manager happens to be an out gay gay manager. If they want to guess? And you're 40? 35. 35? 60. 60? Well, you've got to keep going more for a little bit. 85%. A, a quadruple of the percentage of happy, engaged employees of out gay managers. So that was pretty startling. That was one of the big, so what's that, of his book. What about the club? Uh, sorry? What about if somebody's in the closet, then they would have been counted as somebody who's straight because the employees wouldn't have known, they would have just sort of, yeah. So they weren't able to go, he wasn't able to go further on that. The next question was, so that was engagement, Job satisfaction. Overall, how happy are you with your with your job more generally speaking? Again, people who had a straight manager, this was the answer. This was the answer if you happen to have a gay manager. And then finally, another question. These are just some of this is just some of the uh, responses. Workplace morale, how happy are you at work? Do you like the environment that you're in? 40% said they were if you had a straight manager. 85% if you happen to have a gay manager. So this was really startling, startling so what? In fact, it almost looked like it was a gay mafia, sort of a gay agenda thing, you know, and it made, it made the press. Professor Snyder actually spoke to the McKinsey Glam Conference, the LGBT group, we had him come in and speak, he presented all this. He was on Oprah, literally, he was on the Oprah show, talking about the G quotient, about all this, because this was revolutionary. And he then tried to figure out what is it that is making employees without gay managers so much happier. And he came up with this, this framework. 
He said there were essentially four things that made gay, out gay managers better managers uh, overall. I'm going to start with the self-awareness. Gay managers, he found, when he did interviews, when he did other, other research, had a better self-awareness than the average straight manager. For those of us in the room who are LGBTQ, that's kind of like a the comment, right? You know, anybody who is out at work is probably more self-aware because you had to do more work about who you are and how you fit in. So that self-awareness is the, is the beginning, the base of it all. The second one, then, is this um, intuition down here that I would say. That self-awareness, if, again, if you're out at work, if you're out in school, you are constantly reading your environment. You have to. It's like almost a matter of survival. You're trained to do this over time. So you, you get very good at reading, a, reading a, a, a particular environment. Should I be out or not? Is this safe environment to be out or not? And that actually trains a different muscle as a manager as well, in terms of being, you know, having an intuition and working better with your employee. Building on that, you have adaptability. Once you've been able to read the situation, okay, I can be out. What should I do? Or, you know what, Susie seems to be too quiet. I'm going to pull her into the meeting. I'm her manager. I'm going to do that. There's this positive correlation amongst all that on general management skills. And then finally, there's a resilience factor. There's this perseverance piece that this is tough stuff. And especially for LGBT folks, it's not like you come out once. You come out almost every day, a new situation, a new team, a new peer, a new manager, a new professor. You have to decide whether you're actually going to use the, the G word or not, use the husband word or boyfriend word or not. Those sorts of things. So the perseverance is there as well. So all of those sort of lead to, you know what, something to be proud of here at World Pride. Gay managers are better. Out gay <laughs> managers are better. That's pretty cool stuff. The G quotient. Um, so if that's all the positive stuff, there's also a cautionary tale here. Uh, how many people know Lord Brown? I've heard the story of Lord Brown. Okay, I'm guessing something like 10% of you. Uh, so Lord Brown, a few years back, Lord Brown was the global CEO of BP, one of the world's largest corporations, and had been, uh, had been so for a decade, decade and a half, when um, suddenly a boyfriend, a relationship that went south, um, that he was in with a much younger fellow in London, uh, who had been a uh, rent boy, had a back background, sued him in the press. And it was the downward spiral of Lord Brown. And eventually he had to resign in, the, in a big, uh, big controversy. It hit all the tabloids. And so Lord Brown is, uh, it's a cautionary tale in terms of being in the closet. This is a guy who's so successful, like literally the CEO of one of the largest corporations in the world. Uh, it was a, uh, a lord uh, in Britain, very well respected, and was taken down because this, this piece that he was hiding, this part of his life that he was hiding, came to haunt him. Uh, I think Sadiq and I both had the, uh, um, the privilege of hearing Lord Brown speak at the Europe conference that the London Business School sponsors a couple of years ago, and he told his story. He's written this book called The Glass Closet, and I'll never forget, he said to the group of folks that, you know, about the size that, that we're here, a bunch of students, uh, MBA students from across Europe and, and LBS in particular, he said, mine is a cautionary tale. Do not do what I did. I had to spend so much energy of, of my time in the closet over those years, and I couldn't put together the two parts of my life. And that one part actually was, became, the down, the, it became my downfall. So his is a cautionary tale. So it's something, uh, and by the way, I would highly recommend that book as well. So, so far you've got to buy the Jeep Ocean, and you've got to buy um, the Glass Closet by the way. All right, so that's sort of a cautionary tale. Uh, it wouldn't be a McKinsey, uh, a McKinsey uh, presentation without a framework. This is not a McKinsey framework. Um, some other corporation, some other consultancy is known for a two by two matrix, that's not us. Uh, but this is, this is a, um, one of my favorite frameworks in 22 years of McKinsey that I've come across. Um, and it's called the Jahari Window. Uh, it's not a McKinsey framework, as I said. It's actually from two psychologists, um, American psychologists in 1955. Jahari sounds very far east, eastern and cool and you know, all that sort of thing. It's actually the, name, the, the first names of the two psychologists, Joe and Harry. So they called it the Jahari Window. Um, 
I'm going to, this is a gift to you in terms of how to think about navigating the corporate closet, being out or not. This, this particular uh, framework worked for me. We teach this at, with the McKinsey and just leadership skills overall. Joe, Joe and Harry came up with this, these four quadrants. On the one axis, it's things that I know about me and things that others don't know about me. And up above, what I know about, sorry, what, <laughs> what others know about me and what others don't know about me. And up above, what I know about me and what I don't know about me. So let's start in this quadrant up here in the top, in the top, top left. So something that I know about myself and you know about me. The example here could be that I'm Canadian. Uh, I told you I was Canadian. Leo, I think, may mention that I was, I was Canadian. So you guys know I'm Canadian. I know I'm Canadian. We share that knowledge. What would anybody want to shout? What you what you would call maybe that quadrant? Any any thoughts? Yep. Sorry. Open self. Perfect. Any others? Joe and Har Joe and Harry called it. Oh, Joe and Harry called it. The, the arena, the public arena. So this is something that's out there. So you know I'm Canadian, uh, and I know I'm Canadian. If we move over a little bit here to things that I know about me and, uh, sorry, that I don't know about me, but others do, that's called a blind spot. So that may very well be that, you know, when I publicly speak, um, I'm like this, but I wonder, I, I talk, all, I'm moving all the time on stage. Um, I may not know that about myself, but you guys would observe that and you would sort of say, Brian, that's distracting. Just you know, get to this, the podium and just stay there. That would be better for you. You'd be a better public speaker. There you go. I may not actually realize that I, I'm, I'm sort of wondering when I do that. They call that a blind spot. Joe and Harry, Joe and Harry they're, these psychologists, sort of said, the way that you can best interact as human beings um, and I think it was Shelley who said this earlier, that authenticity allows us, you had a good quote, I wrote it down, authenticity allows us to relate to one another best when you actually are who you are authentically. And this is what this whole, this whole uh, framework is all about. The blind spot allows us to actually learn because you would tell me, as I said, you wandered around the stage too much, it was distracting, stop, right? So how do you, how do you sort of expand the public arena? How do I get to know that? You tell me that. They call it just simply giving feedback. That's great. So suddenly I'm now better and I know something more about myself that I didn't know. The next quadrant is why this is a gay framework in my mind. Why it works so well in a gay context. Let's go to this third quadrant down here. So this is something I know about myself, but you don't. The public doesn't know about me. What would, what would you call, what would be a, a couple of words for that quadrant? Self awareness. Self, self -awareness? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Mem memories? Okay, so, so you know something, but the public doesn't. Secrets. A secret? Perfect. A closet? Perfect. Closet? Perfect. This is why it's almost like a gay thing. Yeah, so a secret, a closet. They call it the facade. Because this was not just, they weren't, weren't talking just in gay terms. But to me, this framework works so well, particularly in, in a gay setting. It's the facade. And as LGBT difference, LGBTQ difference, this is one of these things that we can often hide if we want to. It's sort of like religion. People don't know if you're Christian, if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're agnostic, you're atheist. You have to ask, you have to know a little bit more. So people will hide that sometimes. Well, being LGBTQ is often the same way. And there's an assumption in our hetero heteronormative societies that everybody's straight. So if you don't do something you know, proactive, they're going to assume that you're straight. So you have to proactively come out. And so what would you, what would you call this, you know, moving the, you know, something from the facade, something that you know, something in the closet? How do you expand that quadrant to be more in the public arena? What would you call that? Sorry? Revelation. Revelation. Perfect. They called it disclosure. Yep, exactly. And so Joe and Harry sort of said the way we can stop disharmony in the work in the workplace, the way you can build best relationships, to quote Shelby, the way you can authentically relate to others better is to walk around with the biggest public arena that you feel comfortable with. 
And so it doesn't mean that you constantly have to say, hey, by the way, I'm gay. Oh, you, open, you get into an elevator, I'm gay. You know, you don't have to do that all the time. But to the extent you can, do. Because that's when you will find some of the most interesting relationships. And you will find out that that person who, you know, maybe your new colleague, your new manager who's just come in, who you think is, you know, from the rural south in the United States. I'm going to make some stereotypes here. She must be, she's going to be homophobic, of course. So I'm not even going to go there. And then somehow she finds out you're gay, and you find out she's got a gay son. Guess what? Your, that relationship is going to go deep. Even more than it may justifiably so, and your straight colleagues will kind of go, well, how do you guys get along so well? Oh, she's got a gay son. Sorry. You know, I got lucky. Um, so, that's, so that's sort of their point. Just to be, for those who want to be complete, they, you know, they, the fourth part they call the unknown. Uh, this and they said the only way you can sort of figure out what's going on there is if you're actually you know, going to psych psychoanalysis and figure out you know all these deep dark secrets. That was that was sort of the way they got business. I think. Anyway, so that's the Tahari window. I give that to you as a precursor to the following story. Uh, Twenty-three years ago, I joined McKinsey Toronto, um, and I was not out when I joined McKinsey because I thought I was going to be joining a very conservative company. I thought it was sort of like an I bank. Sort of, sorry for the eye makers in the room, but you know, I thought it was going to be a very sort of cutthroat, competitive, you know, non-supportive environment. It was 23 years ago, uh, and I had just recently come out a year or two earlier, so um, I wasn't out when I joined McKinsey. My very first study at McKinsey, my first engagement at McKinsey, was with a retail bank in, in Toronto. And I'm at the retail bank for about four months, and the, very, the, the senior client, the head of market for the Canadian bank, is our senior client. And so the partner on the McKinsey study is the counterpart to this guy named Jim. I'm like a brand new associate on the team, right? So I sort of like occasion and meeting with Jim, but you know, that's it. Um, my boyfriend and I uh, had moved to Toronto for my McKinsey job. And we were walking in the gay area of Toronto near Church and Wells, the gay village. And we were walking, and 23 years ago when we were doing something radical, we were holding hands as we were walking down the streets. Because we were from rural Saskatchewan, we were from Saskatchewan, rural Canada, and we just thought it was so cool that in Toronto we could actually hold hands. So there we are in the gay village, 23 years ago, holding hands. We're walking down the street, and who comes walking towards us? And I'm pretty sure sees us holding hands, but Jim, the senior client at this bank. And I'm, and I'm not out at McKinsey, I'm like, oh crap. So I throw the hand away from you know, my boyfriend, Brad, and Jim comes on, and, and Jim, I said, oh, Mr. Allen. And Jim says, oh, um, it's Brian, right, from the McKinsey team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He says, oh, so you know, uh, you know, what, what are you doing here? And I said, and I'm ignoring the fact that I'm with Brad, right? And oh, well, you know, we're just going grocery shopping or something like that. And Jim says, oh, well, I'd like you to meet my boyfriend, Renee. And then I said, oh, well, you know, you can meet my boyfriend, Brad. <laughs> For the next four years, I served Jim at that bank. And he would request the McKinsey staff and team over the course of the next year. I didn't come out of McKinsey for another year. But over that, over that year, he specifically asked that he wanted to work with me. This was like client sponsorship. The McKinsey staffing pool and the partners, you know, at McKinsey were like, wow, you're so good, you've got client relationships with the senior guy, it's, it's great. Jim wasn't out at the bank either. I came out a year later at McKinsey, Jim came out at the bank four years later. But that was a relationship, a connection that we made. And, and I have to say, it was because we happened to run into each other in that circumstance, and Jim was willing to share with me that disclosure point, he was willing to share with me that Rene was not just some guy he was walking with, but it was his boyfriend. I could then share with Brad, and the four of us became very good friends. So again, that, that disclosure, that large framework will allow you to connect with other folks. And it will be good, personally, professionally, and it's just a hell of a lot easier as well. Um, that's Jim, by the way, we're still good friends. That's a picture from way back when, as you can tell with the hair and the really bad, the really wide tie. Um, uh, and so Jim and I are still friends, Jim and, Jim and Brad and Renee and myself. So authenticity matters. I'm going to use myself just for, I've got just only two, two, more, um, uh, two more slides and then we'll be done. 
Um, authenticity matters because I have been able to be out of McKinsey after that first year. Um, there's been a whole bunch of stuff that has happened. Um, this is a picture of Nick in 1998. Um, you can't quite see it there, but that's me and my boyfriend Brad, now my husband. Uh, we got we made a public commitment ceremony in 1998, and then uh, he's a lawyer, um, and we both were involved heavily in the uh, fight for equal marriage in Canada um, through our church. We were successful, and in 2003, the law changed in Canada, in, in, in Toronto, um, and we got married three days after the law changed. So we've been married fully since 2003, which is pretty cool. Um, in McKinsey, I helped found the gay group, the, uh, the, uh, the gay uh, GLBTQ group, um, and we sponsor a, a number of events like this around the world. Um, this one, this is a particular, this is from a um, Brazilian, one of the conservative Brazilian business newspapers. Uh, we support uh, Reaching Out Brazil, uh, which is the Reaching Out MBA conference in the US. We were the founding sponsor of that, and we, we founded their expansion into Brazil. So this is from a few months ago, and I spoke down there. I was then interviewed by the, by the, pa the conservative paper, a conservative business paper, in terms, and I can't read this because it's all in Portuguese, but apparently it's pretty good. And, and it, it sort of said, you know, McKinsey is pushing the frontiers. Um, and, and I can say that this, you know, what IE and what IE Out is doing here is part of a broad movement around the world. Uh, the Reaching Out Conference, as an example, is having its first expansion into Asia in Hong Kong in September. Uh, again, McKinsey will be there. Had I not been out all these years, I wouldn't have been able to, to see any of this happen. Uh, I haven't you know, been pushing all of this. I get to just be part of this, a part of the team and the group of McKinsey that's doing some of this, which is pretty cool. Um, over the last 20 years, we have moved, this is, I'm not gonna bore you with all of these, but over the last 20, 22 years, 21 years, the GLAM group, uh, used to be called Gays and Lesbians at McKinsey, it's a great acronym, GLAM, very glamorous, uh, but unfortunately, not unfortunately, it's now expanded for us to GLBTQ at McKinsey, we still call it GLAM. GLAM has moved through uh, you know, a bunch of different phases, and we've done a whole bunch of work now on a pro bono basis as well. We are creating a gay mafia um, of LGBT executives, we don't call it that, but we run leadership classes for 20 or so uh, SVP, EVPs, C-suite, LGBT executives. We've now run 20 of them around the world. Uh, Sadiq has actually uh, uh, been, been one of them as well, which is fantastic. Um, and we, we are creating a, a global group. We now have about 220 LGBTQ executives around the world who are part of this, this McKinsey Foster Network. Um, I like to call it the Game Mafia. I think that it just drives the Christian right even crazier, so that's right. <laughs> Um, I'm going to leave you uh, as the last speaker to this, uh, I think, to this conference. Um, there is a, uh, Rabbi Hillel, who's a, a Jewish rabbi, um, has the following three, three questions uh, that he's, he's famous for. And I think it's a nice call to action at this point of world pride here, and given what you all have done. Uh, my thesis here is that, you know, the best out is being out. And it's, it, it's important because it matters to you personally and it matters to the world. So his three questions, I think, apply nicely. The first one that Rabbi Havel said, if, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? So Rabbi Havel sort of said, you have to look after yourself. At the heart of it, know who you are. Be smart to yourself, be protective to yourself, promote yourself, do it smartly, but that's important. That's the base of where everything comes from. But you can't stop there. The second question is, if I am only for myself, then what am I? LGBT community is a community for a reason. And we, we all sort of uh, progress the, the world be, in, together with others. And so there's a real call to action for others. And then of course, Hillel's last question is, if not now, when? So here we are at World Pride in Madrid. Thank you to the IE Club for hosting this. Um, I would ask each of you to do what you can in your lives, professionally and personally. Um, this, is, this is the way the world changes.
it all starts with you. Um, I would like to uh, thank um, the IE Club. So I think uh, I am from Canada. I always love to stress the fact that I'm from Canada because everybody thinks I'm from south of the border. Um, I have a little Royal Canadian Mountain Moose that I would love to give to Michelle. And I have a little Canadian maple leaf maple syrup. And I'm going to give that.